Well, it's that time of the week again. It's time for Chit Chat Across the Pond, and this is episode number 790 for March 30th, 2024, and I'm your host, Allison Sheridan. This week is, uh, our guest is, as it seems to always be true lately, because I'm not trying to do any other Chit Chat Across the Ponds anymore, it is Bart Bouchats with another installment of Programming by Stealth. How are you doing today, Bart? I am good. Does that mean that the average weight of Chit Chat Across the Pond has gotten heavier? Because we're all heavy now. <laughs> I think so. I, I mean, I'm not saying I'm not going to, but I've just, uh, I don't know. It's a lot of work to do two shows. You know that, right? Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I have a couple of lights actually lined up, but I don't want to stop what we're doing now because I'm having too much fun. Uh, but I have a few lights in, in the bag for you at some stage. So we will talk about less, um, less deep stuff. Okay, you let me, I might even talk about a vacuum cleaner that makes water. My Ooh. vacuum cleaner is called a submarine. Okay, there's, if that is in <laughs> a tease, I don't know what is. <laughs> I know. <laughs> All right, anyway. let's kick in. We're still playing in JQ. We got more fun to do. We do indeed. So we are picking up for part two of what I had thought would be a very quick, I was even afraid it was going to be too short for a whole episode, was our look at lookup tables. <laughs> and I guess I'll start this episode by saying that the people listening along will have heard me use the contraction lookup all of last time two weeks ago and it confused you and jill of kent agreed with me that it was confusing <laughs> yeah and i was afraid of a different confusion because i thought it might mix things up between records which represent rows and tables and so i was afraid of using the word table in two places or i thought it would have been confusing and ironically that made it confusing. So, <laughs> yeah, to me, lookup is an adjective. It's a lookup table, a lookup thing. And so, uh, you've now gone back through the 163 show notes and kind of clarified why you said it that way and, and the differences. And you kind of mix it up the way you say it. But it's obvious now that you're talking about a lookup table and calling it a lookup sometimes. So, perfect. Yes, exactly. So, the people who read back will notice the show notes have changed and the show notes for this installment are now lookup tabley. So there we <laughs> okay. go. That's Perfect. a little PSA out of the way. So where we had, st we spent a lot of last time being very philosophical. We, we talked about the whys and the hows and that there are different types of dictionary and all so forth. And we learned about records representing rows and tables and lookup tables being indexes into data. So if you need to search the same data very often, if you have an index or a lookup table, you can jump straight to the answer and that's really efficient. And if you're looking up 100,000 records or something, the efficiency really stacks up quickly. And the other efficiency is to your code. Instead of these big long lines with select statements and all this kind of stuff, you can just go name of lookup table dot the value you want. And hey, presto, you have your answer. I, and I think you you talked about that last time, and uh, this time I've cheated and read ahead in the show notes. This time I think your examples, like three quarters of the way through this, really bring that home, that efficiency and how much e easier it is to search if you have these indexes or lookup tables. Yes, exactly. So we learned about them in a very broad way last time, and then we looked into building them. So make it, we have data and we want to turn it into a lookup table. And we did that using an intermediate format called entries. This is something JQ made up. Um, to make their functions simple, they basically went, meet us halfway, you make your data be this shape, and then you can use this function without having to worry about lots of arguments and things. And so we just arrange our stuff into entries, hand it over to the JQ from entries function, and it produces our lookup table. And that's where we stopped. And what we now need to do is the opposite. We need to start with a lookup, take it apart and maybe put it back together or maybe reassemble it completely. Because a lookup table is extremely efficient at going straight to a specific answer. So if you have a lookup table that maps, say, the name of a food item in your menu to its price, you can find the price of a hot dog instantly, effectively, because you go basically name of lookup dot hot dog and hey press so you have your answer. But if you need to find all food items that start with a D. Well, now the lookup table is actually in your way because you can't actually easily do a select on it. So now you actually need to pull it apart to search it. It's not difficult to do, but you do need to pull it apart to filter it down. So if you have a lookup table with 50 keys and you want half of those keys to go away, you actually have to pull it apart, pull, shove it through a, a select while it is not a lookup table, 
and then the pieces that are left you put them back together and then you have a smaller lookup table right and of course the other thing is you may want to completely rearrange the shape of the lookup table if you are handed a lookup table of employees by say employee number and you are constantly trying to look through server logs and you always have usernames well if it's indexed by user id that's useless to you you need it by username so what you actually need to do is be able to take someone else's lookup explode it jiggle it about and put it back together into the lookup table that you want instead of the one you were given and this brings us back to why this series exists at all because i ended up fighting a lot with jq because Troy Hunt decided that when you download the list of breaches for your domain, it should be indexed by user who was breached. Back, back up, back up. Troy Hunt, who is? Explain what Troy Hunt the is. The person when he who has. does Have I Been Pwned, which we will revisit in great detail in about two or three paragraphs, I think. Okay, so start your sentence over again. Just wanted to give context of what you were talking about when you said Troy Hunt. Yes, so basically you can download a list of all of the compromise, all of the accounts on a domain you own that you've proved you own uh, caught up in data breaches. And Troy decided that he should index it by the user because I guess he assumed the most common search would be, is Bob compromised? Or where is Bob compromised? Because at this, at this stage, everyone's been in a data breach. So, so the question isn't a yes, no question. The question is where, which passwords does Bob have to change? And so the index is by user. And once you've done an initial onboarding, what matters is who was caught up in the breach that was added last week. So you'll get an email saying, you know, 10 of your addresses were caught up in this newly discovered breach. So what I need to do is the opposite. I need to index by the breach and get the list of people, not by the person to get the list of breaches. And I knew JQ was the answer. And I knew just enough JQ to think I knew what I was doing, <laughs> spend three hours swearing and eventually get there and decide that I needed to learn this. And then I started learning it. And because what I'm learning, I want to share, we ended up doing this series. And then I ended up learning way more JQ than I ever thought. And it turns out to be spectacularly useful in my work life. And I am now doing jujitsu jiu on Jason, which is really hard to say, um, <laughs> that I would never have imagined, uh, which is really cool. And, you know, a wise person has often said that the best way to learn is to teach. So <laughs> that's, that's, I'm dog food in this one here, folks. So basically, that's what we're doing today. We are doing the pull them apart and reassemble them. And then we're going to move on to my favorite thing about lookup tables. And it sounds cool. Data enrichment. Who wouldn't <laughs> want some data enrichment? So this is, I'll give you a real world problem. So you're looking through some log files and it tells you that someone with the user ID Bart B was logged into the VPN at night. And you're trying to say, Bart B, is that, uh, is that that Brad fella over or that, you know, that Bart Brogan fella, or is that that, you know, Bart, some, I don't know, I'm terrible at imagining things. Anyway, <laughs> someone else, but you probably have data that maps usernames to actual people. So what if while processing one data set, you could reference a completely separate lookup table? It's not a lookup table you build from the data you're processing. It's a lookup table that's just adjacent, that just exists next to it somewhere. And pull that data in to enrich what you have and then say, well, actually, Bart Bouchot was a naughty boy logging into the VPN after hours. How dare he? he should, he's not supposed to be working late. It was three in the morning, for God's sake. Uh, I know you hate it when I say you could do that in Excel, but I'm going to say you could do that in Excel. That's one of the things that a VLOOKUP or an HLOOKUP is for, is you can say, okay, look in this table over here, take the third column over, you know, find the match in this column, take the thing in the third column, and then take it and then stuff it over into this other spreadsheet. Um, it's yeah. not anything like what you're doing, but it does the same kind of thing. And so it's, it's super useful. It's a different implementation of the same concept. Right. And if you're in database land, you're thinking, oh, Bart, you're talking about joins. And if you're a database person, yes, I am talking about joins, because that, again, is the same concept, just implemented differently. Because Excel, Excel uses the word lookup because it's philosophically the same thing. But in Excel, it's not a dictionary. In Excel, it's a table, because in Excel, the universe is a table. <laughs> Everything in Excel land is tables, right? It's tables all the way down in Excel land. Um, 
And you'll, you'll be happy to know I'm actually starting to like Excel and actually starting getting good at writing formulas, even though I think the syntax is still horrible. But I am getting better <laughs> at it. So I, I may love it yet. You sent me something the other day that said that you'd made fire. I had. I'd made a, I'd made a genuine pivot table all by myself to solve an actual problem I had. And I was smart enough to know that a pivot table could solve it. And how? to use a pivot table to actually solve it. And it was a very real world problem. And uh, I got some nice pat on the back from my boss going, excellent, that answered my question perfectly. Yay. Great. I told you Yay. the data. We'll convert you yet, Bart. <laughs> there we are. Now, I set you a challenge at the end of the previous installment since we were building our lookup tables all over the place. So we have been working very heavily with our uh, list of Nobel Prizes. And so I wanted you as a challenge to write a lookup table to be able to just get what were the Nobel Prizes for 2017? Or what were the Nobel Prizes for 2022? So basically a lookup table of Nobel Prizes by year. And I was, I was slightly naughty of me to do it this way because there is more than one Nobel Prize in a year. So that means that you had to do the hardest type of lookup table, which is one where you map to an array of possible values, not a one-to-one -one mapping like with you know, the name of food to a price, right? A hot dog mm -hmm. has a price, whereas 2024 has, actually 2024 has zero Nobel Prize winners, but it will have five of them when, when we get around to it. Uh, or is it four? Yeah, anyway, an amount greater than one. So that meant you had to use the group by function to split your data into appropriately sized little chunks and then build your lookup table against those chunks of your data. So... Uh, most of the sample solution in my case is comments. It is very, very heavily commented and not that much uh, actual jQuery. So we start by exploding our prizes and then sending the pieces to the group by function and telling it to group by year. So that will build, actually we don't explode the prizes, sorry, group by once in an array. So we just send the prizes straight to group by and group by takes one array and makes it an array of arrays and every child array is grouped by whatever you told it to. So we now have an array of arrays of Nobel Prize records, and each one, each child array is all of the ones for 1900, the next child array 1901, the next child array 1902. So we now have our groups of prizes, which we then explode and recapture all at once. And that structure we were so used to seeing now, open square bracket immediately followed by dot two square brackets to explode <laughs> it apart. So we basically explode it, but contain the pieces. <laughs> and while it is exploded, we then need to build these entries as JQ calls them, which are dictionaries with a key named key and a key named value. They will become a lookup table. And so the key we want is the year. Now, our child array has many prizes, but all of those prizes have the same year. So you could take the year from any one of them, but every array has a first element, right? Because if there were no elements, group I would not have made the child array. So they all have at least one. So just I just take it from dot zero dot year. It's as good a one as I need to take it from. And you didn't do dot string because you knew year already was... A string? Yeah, because it's dirty data, as we keep calling it. But Well, I threw it in as to string just to prove that I remembered that the key, the value for the key, key, had to, yeah, be, I know, right? had to be in quotes. <laughs> so I, I put it in there on purpose. Excellent. That's a, that's a good way to learn. That is, I approve entirely. Defensive coding. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the value has to be the entire array of all of the prize records for that year, which is just sitting in dot. So my value key has the value dot. At that stage, it's all ready. We have created the pieces of our lookup. So we then send them to the from entries function, which builds our lookup. That is that. So the bonus challenge, actually, no, before we do the bonus challenge is, is where I get to my examples. So now that we have this file existing, if we would like to find, uh, actually, sorry, the first thing is we can take our file and we can save our lookup table to a file. So I have said JQ minus F and the name of my challenge solution, Nobel prizes.json, and then the redirection arrow, so the greater than sign, Nobel prizes dash by year dot JSON. And so now our lookup table is saved safely in Nobel prizes dash by year dot JSON. So if we wish 
to find out a particular prize, we can just query that file. Now, if you're lazy, not if you're lazy, if you don't need to keep your lookup around forever, and if you don't mind wasting a few CPU cycles because you're an M3 Mac or whatever, you don't have to save the lookup to a file to use it. You can pipe the output of the JQ command that builds the lookup to another JQ command that uses the lookup. Hmm. So if you immediately pipe the output of building our lookup to JQ.1980, it will tell you the prizes for 1980. The small subtlety being you have to quote 1980, hmm. otherwise JQ thinks you're asking it for 0.198. No, <laughs> of course it would. <laughs> Which it will tell you is 0 0.198. <laughs> Great. Thanks, JQ. That was not what I meant at all. Let me guess. You found that out the hard way. Yes, I did. I was like, what? <laughs> what, what, what? You know, and then I, you know, I, I took out the second pipe. Like, no, my data's fine. Why is, oh, ah, I see the confusion. So yes, that is the answer there. But the key point here is that instead of having to do a select, so instead of saying dot prizes, explode it, pipe it to select, dot year double equals 1980, I just said dot 1980. And I got straight to my answer. So even that very straightforward lookup already makes our queries way more human friendly. It's a lot easier for humans to read. Yeah. But I said a bonus challenge. Because the more complex your data is, the more complex your lookup tables may need to be. And in the case of Nobel Prizes, the most logical lookup table is by year, by category. I would like to know who won the physics prize in 1970. Not just all the prizes in 1970, or all the physics prizes, but the physics prize in 1970. So what we'd really like is a two-level lookup where we could say dot .1970.physics and have it just jump straight to the answer. So that was the bonus challenge. And... The key concept to a multi-level lookup table is that it is a lookup table where the thing you look up is another lookup table, where the thing okay. you look up is the final answer. So it's a lookup table of lookup tables of records. So like a two-dimensional array is an array of arrays, it's a lookup table of lookup tables to our final piece of data. I, I, I can't, I'm coming to, you're looking at my face. No one knows why he's pausing there. It's because I've got this huh, look on my face. I, what confuses me at this point is I don't know the shape of the data that you're talking about. Like, I don't know what it looks like in my head to, I would, I think I'd understand it better if I knew what it looked like when you said that, you know, are, are there squirrely brackets inside of square brackets or vice versa or what? Squirrely, squirrely, square. It's squirrely, squirrely, square. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so at the very top level, you're going to have an open squirrely bracket, and it's going to say 1900 colon. Okay. And then instead of that being a square bracket and then your Nobel Prizes, it will be another curly okay. where it says physics colon. And then is your square bracket containing the prize. Wait, is no, this... Only, sorry, then there's no square bracket. Sorry, then you're straight into the answer because there is no... You're now in a, you're now a one... You missed, one mapping, sorry. you missed my question. You just described what the answer would look like. I meant, what does the data set that you're creating this from look like? After your solution it's a, to the original problem, what does the data look like that then you say it's oh, a two-level lookup? Wait, which one are you asking me to describe? The answer to the first At the, challenge? After you do or? the first challenge, you've got a data set that looks like something. It has a structure. Ah, What okay. does that so structure look top like? Top level is... So the top level is a dictionary, so it's a curly. Okay. And then the first key will be 1900, colon, mm -hmm. open square bracket, ah. a curly for the first prize in 1900, comma, a curly for the second prize in 1900, comma, a curly for the... But everything under 1900 is a, is a square bracket. Yeah, and then you finish the 1900 square bracket, and then you have 1901, colon, new square bracket. Good, the 1901 okay. prizes. Okay, so now when so you start talking about a two-level lookup, are you saying that you have to do two levels inside that or the solution you're creating is two levels? So we're starting with the same input data, right? It's just mm -hmm. our normal Nobel Prizes, but the output this time is going to be a curly bracket, 1900 colon, a curly bracket, physics colon, straight into the data. Okay, 
Sim- okay, I, somehow I thought you were going from chemistry. the end of the first solution into that would be the input to the second solution, but you're not. No, 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 no. That would actually be more difficult because then you'd have to break it apart again. That's why I was stuck. And then reassemble okay. it. <laughs> Aha, yes, no, no, no. So basically we're back to our original list of physics, pri- or sorry, not physics, all the prizes. Oh, I okay. might like the physics one best, but they're all important. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So we again start very similarly, and there's a real symmetry here if you look at the solution, because it is our first solution with a more detailed inside. So we again start by grouping our prizes by year, because the top level lookup is still by year. So we still want to get all of our prizes broken into a year. So we start the same. And then we do our thing where we explode them inside square braces. So explode and catch or catch and explode, whatever way you want to you want to phrase that. But now instead of building our simple entries, we're now going to build a whole other lookup table. So effectively we're starting our solution again, only inside here. Okay. So we already know that we need the key to be the year, so we can still steal that. So we say key colon dot zero dot year. So, so far we're still the same, comma. And now things become different. So the value is now, we open our roundy bracket to catch everything together. And in here, we, we build a whole other lookup table. So we catch and explode, and then we build a whole new set of entries where the key is the category and the value is the full record. So key colon dot category value colon dot. And then we build those into a lookup table. And all of that is still the value of our first lookup table. So now we finish that. And then we're left with our top level lookup table. And that goes to from entries to build the outer lookup table. (laughs) So we have a lookup table inside a lookup table. Okay, and the lookup tables themselves are arrays, correct? No, a lookup table is a special type of dictionary. So we call them lookup type dictionaries a few times in the last installment to try to get that as you're into but your head. You, so, but your code says build the entries for the second lookup table. Oh, it's going to be an array, but when it goes through from entries, it will no longer be an array. But in, you, you have to build it as an array. That's right. That's right. Okay. That's what yes. I was getting confused by. Following the indents on this one was tricky. That is why I'm a big fan of writing them in separate .jq JQ files and, and indenting them. Imagine if this was still all on one line, like we started doing our JQ at the start. Yeah. You know what, though? I, I actually, I, I worked on my homework like this, but I find it easier to read and understand when it's in a, in a string, just in, in one long command. That to me is easier to read. Oh. Um, wow. Because of the indent things. I don't know. Maybe it's because you indent by four that it gets really wide and I'm, I'm going back and forth. I like indent by two because then I can, I can look up and down and see the lines easier. Technically speaking, I do indent by two, but I think the, uh, I think the Jekyll pretty is, printer we're using. Uh, yeah, I think the pretty printer we're using is true because... I indent by two, but they're tabs, and then I guess they get turned into four by our theme. Actually, I'm not looking at it in the theme. I'm looking at it in You're not. just as a plain text uh, file, and they're four. Is it a view? Of, yeah, okay. Well, then, then yeah. at some point in time, something is translating them to four. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, because I work on them as two. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I mean, I know you take great care to line them up, but I sat there going, okay, yes. wait, where's the end of that squirrely bracket? Well, cool. So it's still not all that complicated. Well, right, exactly. It's just repetitive because it's nested one inside the other. But now when we go to use our lookup table, we can say, give me .1980.physics. And we jump straight to the physics prize for 1980. Whereas if we were doing that the old way, we'd have to start with our prizes array, explode it, send it to select .year equals 2023, Send that to another select dot category equals piece or physics or piece or whatever, and then we'd get our answer out. Whereas now we just say dot twenty twenty three dot piece or dot nineteen eighty dot physics or dot nineteen seventy dot chemistry, whatever we'd like. Nice. And that's why I love lookup tables. That's why I adore lookup tables. <laughs> so yes. Right. So now let us start going the other way. 
So I'm going to take a moment now to tell everyone about this amazing service called Have I Been Pwned, which was started by an Australian security researcher, sort of on a whim because he thought it would be useful and he didn't think it would ever be very popular. And now it's his job. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and in fact, it's his job and he's now it's now owned by 1Password. No, it's in collaboration with 1Password and owned by someone else. Really big. Yeah. It's a partnership with one password and there's all sorts of really cool stuff. Basically, it's become a giant big deal. It is a massive database of all of the known um, data leaks that are public, that are publicly known, and it's searchable and indexed. And so if you are the owner of an email address, you can prove that ownership to the website and it will tell you every um, data leak that your email address has been caught up in. Or if you own an entire domain, you can prove ownership of the domain and then you can download a report of all of the ownage, all of the, all of the breaches that everyone on your domain is involved in, in two formats. You can have it in, uh, I think it's CSV is the other one, but I don't care about any of the other ones. I'm pretty sure it's CSV, uh, but you can have it in JSON. So you can get a nice JSON download, which will tell you all the breaches that you're caught up in. Um, if you're a small, you know, if you're a hobbyist, um, the lowest tier of Have I Been Pwned for a whole domain is free. Um, so the link to the sign up page is in the show notes. And if you, you know, if you have a small domain for your family or something or a little project you do, you're almost certainly in the free tier. And I would actually advise signing up because it means you then get email notifications when anyone in your domain is caught up in something nasty and you can take a little bit of remediation. Hmm. Okay. Um, I mean, it's useful to sign up on your own email address, if nothing else. But if you own a domain, it's also useful to sign up for the whole domain. And if you sign up for the whole domain, then you do get the JSON downloads, which means you can play along. <laughs> uh, if you sign up, you end up with a file. When you click the download button, you have a file that has uh, a structure as follows. So at the top level, it contains a dictionary with two keys. One called breaches, which is the only one I care about, and one called pastes, which is basically any time your email address is mentioned in a paste bin post. What what is paste bin? It's a imagine a clipboard in the cloud that's public. It's a place where you can just put text, and it just okay. exists at a URL. And it's and what's its relationship to breaches? And there are times when attackers will put things on paste bin. Okay. As a way of publishing for free. It, it's a basically like a, like tweeting it. So then it's public, right? If someone tweets it, it's public. So if someone sticks it in a paste bin, it's public. Yeah, f naughty people like to use paste bin. Okay. It's a thing. I don't care. Uh, so basically, we have some what I'm calling semi-fictitious data. There was a real export used to build this example data, but the actual names and stuff are all completely fictitious, and I just completely emptied the pastes key. So it's just empty. It just does an empty dictionary. The bit we are interested in is the breaches dictionary, and that is indexed by the name. It's basically the email address without the domain. And I think it's done like that so that if you lose the file, you haven't actually done yourself another data breach because <laughs> you know that it's, you know, a Bart B at something. But you can't tell from the file where the Bart B was who would be caught up in whatever breach. So I think it's a really good way of keeping the file safe is to not have the full email addresses, just the bit before the at. And it's your domain, so you know the bit after the at. You don't need Troy Hunt to tell you what comes after the at. It's your domain. So I, I do kind of like the idea that it's just a bit before the at symbol you get. So the these are these are lookup. This is a lookup table with the index is on the name, which is the bit before the at sign. And the value is an array with the names of all the data breaches that you're caught up in. So in the case of our fictitious J. O'Sullivan, who does not exist, they were caught up in just one breach called online or spam bot. E. Green was only in one Dropbox, but whoever the fictitious person M. W. Kelly was, they were caught up in five breaches, two different LinkedIn ones. Turns out there were three breaches of LinkedIn in total, by the way. Um, so she, she, whoever that is, they haven't quite collected the full set. <laughs> if they'd been a LinkedIn user a bit longer, they could have been in three. Anyway. You said they're fictitious. These aren't real people in this. There are real people whose data matches this, but they don't have the names in that file. Okay. 
So basically, I had a download with about 100,000 records, and I asked JQ to pick me five random records. Okay. Which is why we have a very realistic spread of actual breaches, and then I completely changed the names. Great. So, yes, there is someone on planet Earth with those breaches, but you have no idea who, and neither do I anymore, because I totally forget. (laughs) The other thing that is useful to note is that you can get uh, a details of any breach at a standard URL. So if you're going, well, what does it mean to be caught up in onliner spam bot? If you go to haveibeenpwned.com forward slash pwned websites, octosorp pound sign, hash symbol, whatever we're calling it, the name of the breach, it will give you the details for that breach. So then you know that uh, that was a pretty nasty one, which included uh, passwords. I always hate the ones that include passwords. So if we, where am I going here? Right, so we now have a lookup table. It is indexed by the account name, we're going to call it, the bit before the at symbol. And it gives us a list of our breaches. But if we would like to search it based on the breach, we can't at the moment. Right. So we need to disassemble that lookup table. And the opposite to from entries is two entries. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Last so, week you taught us how to build our lookup tables. Now you're telling us, you're teaching us how to take them apart? That's it exactly. Yes, it is a mirror image. Okay. So to build a lookup table, we made an array of entries. So when you ask JQ to rip apart a lookup table, JQ will give you an array of entries. So if we say to JQ, dot breaches pipe to two entries, we will get back an array of dictionaries, each of which has a key named key and a value with a value. So in this case, key J O'Sullivan value, the array, which is online or spam, but key E green value Dropbox, key MW Kelly value Dropbox, KO Moo, LinkedIn, LinkedIn, yada, yada, yada. So you can see that the structure we get back is awfully familiar looking because it's actually the structure we were putting in. Right, what we started with before in in previous lessons. Exactly. So now we have an array containing records. I mean, they're oddly named. I wouldn't have called it key. I would have given it a more sensible name. But hey, we have it. It's, It's got a shape now that we know. So if we want to query that, we now can. Um. So we can also save it back to a normal array. We can save this back to a normal array of records so that we now have the data in a normal shape, right? So if we take our dot breaches and we pipe it to two entries, and then we do our usual trick of exploding and catching the pieces, well, we can just use the standard JQ for building a new dictionary to build ourselves a new dictionary where we give it the key account name with the value dot key and the key (laughs) breach names with the value dot value. And now what we get is a sane structure that we could save to a file. And now we have the data in a structure that makes sense for searching in any which way we like. Now, the code I have in the file is quite long. So I've redone the code with all the comments taken out. Dot breaches, two entries, exploded and catch, open curly, account name colon dot key, breach name colon dot value. It's actually really short code. It just looks very long when I fill it up with comments. It's also giggle making that it's account name colon dot key. It's like, okay, we just had dot key and dot value. Now we're just going to turn around and say, okay, pretend, just read everything we learned last week. Read it backwards. Well, yes, to be perfectly honest, because what we're ending up with now as the output here is very equivalent to our inputs last time, which is an array of record type dictionaries. Right? They all have an account name. They all have breach names. So we now have a nicely structured regular piece of data that effectively represents an Excel table with the columns, account name, and breach names. So great. And we can query that in all the normal ways. We can use our select to find everyone caught up in a particular breach. So if we wanted to know who all was caught up in onliner.spam bot, or onliner spam bot, we could say, take our list of records, explode them, pipe that to select and then ask select to look at all the breach names and if any of those breach names match dot online or spam bot pass that through so 
if you we're going back in time here a little bit, so I'm going to remind you what the any function does because you haven't seen it in a few weeks. You haven't seen it in a few installments, and we only do one every two weeks, so you haven't seen it in quite some time. So the any function, if you give it two arguments, the first argument is a way to make values. So we are saying dot breach names explode it. So the any function is going to explode the breach names, and then what is it going to do with the pieces? It is going to apply the test dot double equals online or spam bot. And so the any function is going to end up receiving a whole bunch of booleans. True, false, true, false, true, false. If any of these booleans are true, the any function returns true. So the select function gets true. And what does select do when you give it true? Just passes it on through. Passes everything that it got. Yes, there we go. Thank you. Yes, that is exactly the piece I was hoping you would say. So in other words, when any of the breaches are online or spam bot, the entire record gets passed through. Otherwise, nothing gets passed through. So this is going to filter down our list of records to just the people who were caught up in the online or spam bot breach. And then we pipe that through to a simple filter that says dot account name to just pull out their name. And so the end result we get is that J. O'Sullivan and A. Hawkins are our two users caught up in online or spam bot. So we have now queried our data from Have I Been Pwned, having transformed it into a list of records. We started with lookup tables, sent it back through using two entries, turned it back to a regular... An array. Just an array. And then now we can use the tools we learned before you taught us how to do lookup tables to get what we want. <laughs> right. Because in this case, we're not, we, we don't want to find all the breaches for a person. We want to find all the people caught up in a breach. So our lookup table was no use to us. It was a hindrance. So we disassembled it and turned it into normal data again and then queried it the old-fashioned way. But of course, if you say to yourself, goodness me, this is the kind of query I'm going to be doing very often. Well, now the logic tells you that you should build a new lookup table. <laughs> Only it should be the other kind of lookup table. <laughs> oh, no. Are you going to do that? <laughs> we are, but I'm actually going to take a little pause here just before we do that. So what we did here was a two-step process, right? We took the lookup table, we transformed it, saved it to a whole new file, and then we used that whole new file to do our work. And that's great for something you're going to use over and over and over and over again. It's like we do the work to build the file once, we save the file, and now we use that file. Okay, great. But what if you just need to quickly change it? You just need to quickly query a lookup. Do you really want to save it? Well, you don't have to, right? You can just pipeline these things together. So if we want to query our lookup table without saving it first, we can just say dot breaches. Pipe that to two entries. So now it has become our array with key, whatever, value, whatever. But we can just select on that. We don't have to save it. We can just select. So we select any. It's now called dot value. OK, fine. We'll call it dot value equals online spam bot. And then the answer we want is called dot key now. OK, we call it dot key. And we get exactly the same answer as we got before without ever building a whole separate file and without saving it. We just took our lookup table, broke it apart, queried it, and then took our answer. Okay. Um, and again, we, we can filter these things using, um, you know, any criteria we like, really. Right, right. That's working. So as to sort of to take this idea and make it generic, the process doesn't really matter what we're trying to answer, right? Whether we're trying to answer the question of, you know, all the breaches that begin with a B or all of the users who are caught up in at least three breaches, like whatever it is you want to do, it doesn't really matter what it is. The shape of the answer is going to be the same. It's going to be convert the lookup to a list of entries, filter the list of entries, and then maybe or maybe not convert that back to a lookup table if you're, what you're trying to do is shrink your lookup table permanently or output the answer or whatever. 
Oh, I didn't think about that so, example where maybe you just want to make the lookup table simpler so that you don't have all this other garbage in your way to fuss around and make sure it's not selected or whatever. Exactly. I mean, you just may actually want the smaller lookup because you got handed this giant big set of data. So you could filter it and then reassemble it and then you have a smaller lookup. So effectively, like you would filter an array using a select, you end up filtering the lookup by breaking it apart, filtering it and putting it back together. Right, right. So let us do that for real by taking our big lookup table and making it a lookup table of all of the people caught up in the Dropbox breach. That was a nice one. That was 68 million email addresses and passwords in 2012, which in 2012 was a very big deal. Oh, Nowadays, yeah. we're used to these giant big breaches, <laughs> but in 2012, we, we, really, we really lost our stuff over that one. Ooh. <laughs> you and I talked all about it on Security Bits, I'm sure, if we were recording that early. Were we? I think so. Yeah, we probably were. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We go, we go way back, Bart. <laughs> we do. That's that's a whole that's a whole dozen years ago. Anyway, so the filter we want, we, our, our dictionary isn't quite at the top level. So we start off with dot breaches, um, and we don't want our answer to be different in shape. So we're not going to we're not going to destroy the existing one. We're going to update dot breaches. We're going no. to basically, so we have a dot breaches and we want to end with a dot breaches. So we're going to use our update assignment operator from two or three installments ago oh. to just redefine the value of dot breaches to our smaller lookup that only contains the Dropbox people. So we're going to start by saying dot breaches pipe equals. In other words, update this in place. Calculate a new answer and stick it right where you found it here in dot breaches. Mm. And to collect together all of our work, I'm just using a round bracket just to collect it all together. So we're opening a round bracket and we close the round bracket all the way at the very end of our file here, right? So everything we're doing is going to go into dot breaches. It's just going to be a new value for dot breaches. So we start off by converting it to our list of entries. We say two entries. Then we do our usual explode and catch the pieces trick. And then we take those pieces we've exploded and we shove them into our select any dot value dot equals Dropbox. OK, so if any of the values in our entries contains Dropbox, it passes through. And so now we have a smaller array of entries. So we just send that back to from entries and now we have a smaller lookup table. Just for anybody who is following along, it's uh, dot double equals. Dropbox, just so we don't get any corrections earlier or later. It, it is correct in the show notes. Yes. And so when we do that, what we see is that we now get an output that is the same shape as the input, right? It's a top level dictionary with the key paste that is still empty and the key breaches. But now it only lists two people, E. Green and M.W. Kelly. And E. Green was caught up in Dropbox and M.W. Kelly in Dropbox and four others. OK, well, so we that's have cool. We have filtered down our doohickey. So um, this, is, this is a good illustrative example. But we have hard-coded Dropbox into this. But would the logic be any different whatsoever if we wanted to filter down to a Facebook breach, or if we wanted to filter down to the infamous Yahoo breach? or whatever else. I mean, the shape of the entire thing would be exactly the same, except the word Dropbox would be something else each time. So many, many installments ago, we learned about variable names that we could use the minus args command line argument to pass in a value that would become a variable. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I let's rewrite, let's rewrite this so that we use a variable named dollar breach, and we just shove that into our double equals. And now we have a completely generic filter that will filter us down to just the relevant entries for any breach of our choosing. So let's now do that by saying jq minus f, the name of the file where we save this nice new generic filter, minus minus arg, and then minus minus arg, if we remember, is one of those weird terminally things where it's one flag that takes two values. The first value is the variable name. The second value is the variable value. So minus minus arg breach linked in means dollar breach will have the value linked in. And then we say the file to use, which is our dummy data. And the output will be the breaches dictionary containing only 
M.W. Kelly because M.W. Kelly was the only person caught up in the LinkedIn breach, which is what we were testing for. Makes sense. I'd forgotten all about that. I'm glad you brought that one back up. And I do want to thank you for uh, reiterating the things that we haven't uh, talked about in a while, because you know how easily I lose <laughs> things fall out of my brain. <laughs> Well, I, I sort of, I do it intentionally because I figure you're, you know, the reason I love working with you is because you are representing the every person. <laughs> or maybe the lowest common denominator. <laughs> All right, but I know you will want this little help, which means that anyone reading along is going to want it too. So uh, yes, you, you put it into my brain, but I'm really happy you do because I think everyone benefits. Well, you're welcome. So, <laughs> at this stage, we have disassembled and turned a dictionary into a list of records. We have temporarily disassembled, shrunk down, and then reassembled our lookups. So the last sort of big piece of this that I promised you was to re-index a lookup table, to basically change it from indexed by one thing to being indexed by something completely different. In the case of the have I been pwned data, the most logical way to re-index the data would be instead of it being breaches by user, have it be users by breach, which is exactly what I wanted when I started learning JQ all those months ago, <laughs> before I went to my big Christmas break. And we can do it. And the result of doing it will be the very useful um, lookup table where you have breaches being collection one colon p trainer dropbox colon the array e green mw kelly kyo moo being m kelly linkedin being m kelly etc and if you want to see how that's done in jq it is in the zip file it's called hibp dash transform to by account name dot jq i'm not going to show you now because this is not a one-to-one -one mapping. There is not a one-to-one -one mapping between the user and the breach. Therefore, the only way to re-index it is to use a variable. And we have not learned how to declare variables. Oh, That's okay. next installment. <laughs> so if anyone would like a sneak peek of next installment, then that's it. That's the sneak peek. You may be very pleasantly surprised how easy variables are. But that is a bonus extra. So you can see what we want to do, but I can't show you how to do it with the have I been pwned data. So we're going to invent a new data set where we're going to transform the data set from one key to another. So this is the fictitious staff list for all of those wonderful workers who make up the um, PBS creators. It's basically me, Alison, and Helma. <laughs> <laughs> so it is a lookup table of employee records. I say employee, that implies payment. There is no payment. Uh, <laughs> I want to raise. <laughs> staff, actually, I call it staff. staff. Yes, you may have a 100% raise, a 1,000% <laughs> raise it's from zero to zero. So it's indexed by username. So Alison S, which then is a record with name, username, email, and website, Bart B, name, username, email, and website, and Helma VDL, with a name, a username, an email, and no website, because I couldn't remember what Helma's personal website was, and I wasn't sure if she'd want us to tell people, even if I could remember. <laughs> so uh, Helma has a null for that one. Sorry, Helma. Um, so what we would like to do is to transform that into a lookup table, not by username, but by email address, because that is a very sensible alternative way to index that same data. And that gives us an excuse to learn how to do this on a simpler data set. Because there's a one-to-one -one mapping from usernames to records and a one-to-one -one mapping from email addresses to records, which is why we don't need a variable. Okay. Because they're one-to-one -one mappings, variables are not needed. Variables are only needed when you have a lookup table where it goes to an array of records. Then you need a variable, as we will discover next time. So it doesn't really matter what you're transforming, right? The algorithm is always the same. Like the set of steps is always the same, regardless of what lookup table you're transforming into what other lookup table. You basically disassemble the original lookup table into an array of entries. You then change the key and the value 
inside of that array of entries to make a new shape. And then you put those new entries together to form a new lookup table. Okay. So we go to entries, we change the entries, and then we go back to a lookup table. Okay. So in this case, we're going to make one by email address. So we start by saying two entries. So our staff data was a top level dictionary. So we just, we can start straight away. We just say two entries. And now we have an array of entries. So we explode and catch as we're so used to. And what we want to do now is we want to have the key become the email address. So instead of the key being the username, we want the key to be the email address. So we do an, up, we do an assignment, but it's the plain old equal sign, which is hmm. plain assignment. And there's a very important reason to use plain assignment and not update assignment. And the difference in the two, which again, we're going back a few weeks, so that's why I'm sort of stressing this point. So when you use pipe equals, to the right of the pipe equals, the value for dot is the current value of the thing you're updating. So the value for dot would be the value of key, which is a username. But we need to be able to reach back to get the email address. So we want the value of dot to be the entire thing, not the current value of key. And so that's the difference in pipe equals and equals. Okay. So the value okay. of dot is the entire current entry. So the email address is at dot value dot email. Okay. So that we makes say sense. dot dot key becomes equal to dot value dot email. And we don't touch anything else in here and everything else stays the same or what? Oh, it does because the value is the full record, which is still what we want the value to be in the new lookup table, right? Right. We just want the index to change. So the only thing that needs to change is the key. Okay, so the result of this will be will be a dictionary with uh, just the username, or sorry, the email address, allison at pbs.demo, and underneath that will be name, username, email, website for allison, for exactly. allison at pbs.demo. Exactly. Okay, it's just going to take this... Press exactly. So literally, the only thing we're changing is the index, right? Because we're just re-indexing. Yeah, just reassigning. So the only the thing key. we have to change. Yeah, exactly. So we we pull it apart. We give the key a new value, and we put it straight back together by piping it to from entries. So That's... two entries change the key from entries. It's very elegant. Yeah. Dang it! I was I didn't want to interrupt you. The words <laughs> I was going to say were that's very elegant. Literally. That. <laughs> right. And again, when I pull it apart and take all the comments out, it's just three very simple lines of code. Right. It really is a nice, nice, simple thing. So that gives us our pretty lookup table that you've just described perfectly. So there's no need to me describing it again. <laughs> okay. it's, it's in the show notes if people want it. So that then brings us to enrichment of data. I can't, I can't make you money, but I can make your data prettier. <laughs> so let's go back to our Have I Been Pwned data set, right? So we have our breaches and we know that J.O. O'Sullivan was caught up in online or spam bot. But really, what does that mean? There must be a source with, infra with details. Troy Hunt must have captured all the metadata about all of these breaches. Of course he did. And not only did he capture it, but he makes it available in JSON format. So the URL, haveibeenpwned.com forward slash API forward slash v3 forward slash breaches, will download a giant big glup of JSON, which if you pipe it through JQ for its pretty printing abilities, will show you that it is a dictionary of records indexed by the name of the breach. You, you took the key out in this case, so we can't, we can't see it in, in the text there, but I trust you. Actually, what it actually downloads is a flat list and I transform it into a lookup. Oh. My, my humblest apologies. Okay. So I transform it into a lookup as I download it. So the curl command is a terminal command for fetching a URL. Right. So we're saying curl and then we give it the URL. And the URL is J, returns JSON, so we can pipe that straight to JQ. Mm -hmm. So we say curl the URL pipe to JQ. And in JQ, we explode the list that Have I Been Pwned gives us. And then we pipe it into the JQ syntax for building an entry. We say key is dot name, the value is dot. In other words, we, the key for a lookup becomes the name from the record and the value is the entire record. 
and then we shove that to from entries. And so we end up now with a lookup table that indexes data breaches by their name. And for each data breach, Troy Hunt gives us a lot of information. So I have a sample one for online or spam bot in the show notes, but it has a name, it has a title, which is basically the name in pretty English. So online or space spam bot. Um, some of the foreign breaches, the title field is actually in like Chinese characters and stuff. So the title oh, field wow. is, is genuinely the human name of the site. It has with the domain name, if there is one, there isn't always a domain name. The count is how many people were caught up in it. So in this case, one, two, three, one, two, three, seven hundred and eleven million four hundred and seventy-seven thousand six hundred and twenty-two. Wow. Uh, the date the breach really happened, which was twenty seventeen. And uh, the date the breach was added to Have I Been Pwned, which was the same day it happened. That's interesting. It's not and always the, the same case. exact time down to the second. That seems improbable. Oh, no, that's added and modified. Okay. Yes, that means that Troy hasn't changed it since he added it. Okay. Then there's a description, which is a nice piece of HTML that describes it pretty nicely. And then the one that I find most useful is data classes. It's an array of the types of data that were caught up in the breach. Oh. In other words, email addresses and passwords for this breach. Hmm. And so whatever was caught up in the breach would be listed under data classes. And that's particularly useful to enrich your data. So uh, let me and back you up a little bit here. Yeah. When we, so we did the curl on the uh, breaches file from the internets, piped it through JQ, we catch and explode our array. Uh, and then you said uh, squirrely bracket key colon dot name comma value colon dot. I expected mm -hmm. to see a series of dictionaries where there was a, a key of name and there isn't. This is just globs. No, no, this is, uh, no, no. The whole file is absolutely what you've described, but the whole file is massive. This is one of the values. This is one of the blobs. This is just one record. Okay, I see what the problem is. The name, that name, is actually really weird stuff like 000 web host colon. And that is one of the names, yeah. One two RF colon. So those, I, I, I couldn't see it because they were so weird looking. One, L26, 17 media. Okay, I was expecting name like online or spam bot is the name in the thing that you found. So there must be one down there that does make sense. Oh, yeah. Scroll down a long way and you get by the weird ones that start with digits because they're in okay. alphabetic order. Got you. So Got if you. you scroll halfway down, you'll find Dropbox and LinkedIn and all of the ones you were expecting. Okay. Well, that makes me happy. I did understand. Yes. Perfect. <laughs> so we have this nice extra data about the stuff in the data file we care about. So can we marry the two together? While I'm querying my list of who has been pwned, can I bring in this information about what each data breach actually means? And the answer is, of course we can, because otherwise I wouldn't have asked the question, would I? <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to learn about another flag for the JQ command. This is the minus minus slurp file flag. Oh, you love you a and good the slurp. Minus, <laughs> I, I do love me a good slurp, as I have a big cup of coffee here in front of me as we record. <laughs> So the minus minus arg let us bring in a variable name with a value. The minus minus slurp file is very similar. It will bring in an entire JSON file as a variable. So it appears in the JQ script as a variable with a name we give it, but the value of that variable is the full content of a JSON file. Oh. So we are going to have a variable named breach details, and we're going to say pull it in from our breaches file. Okay. So the file we downloaded from curl, the whole file will be available to us as a variable named breach details. Wow. The whole file. Okay. Now, there's a very small subtlety here that I don't, I, I wanted to say that without confusing things, and now I'm going to very, very, very slightly confuse things. Slurp file doesn't insist on there being one piece of JSON data in the file. The file could contain multiple dictionaries or multiple strings. It could contain multiple pieces of JSON. So slurp file always arrives as an array because it's like, well, they might have given me more than one. Oh. So we are only giving it one thing in our JSON file. So it will be breach details zero. So we're just always going to be using breach details zero. 
Okay. That's the only subtlety is that it actually, is an array. That can kind of make sense. Like if you don't know what you're getting, you better slap it all in an array so you know you've got a thing. Precisely. And then you can use length to figure out what you got, right, within your script. But yes, absolutely. It's a very safe way to do it is to say, okay, fine, I'll just make an array. So now let us do something very real world. Let us imagine that we would like to send a mail merge to all the people caught up in the whatever in in uh, I think I do it for the online or spam bot breach because that was the first breach to come up in my sample data. Um, so we want to send a mail merge to all of our staff caught up in that mess. And we want to enrich that mail merge with the data from our nice new file we got from Have I Been Pwned. And Not that this is a, a made up merge. example for you or anything. Okay. <laughs> Definitely not something I may do regularly for reels. Definitely not. Um, and of course, a mail merge, we'd like it in CSV format so that it can actually be plopped into Word and then spat out in the, you know, in the, in the normal way. So we're going we're gonna to re-remember that we can use at CSV to output some CSV from our JQ filters. Oh, so right. that gives us another excuse to bring back some old knowledge. So we are going to start by finding all the relevant breaches or so all the relevant people, and then we're going to enrich the data for them. So we start off with our dot breaches and we pipe it to two entries. So we now have our breaches in a, you know, in a, as our entries. We explode and catch, as we always do. We select any dot value is equal to online or spam bot. So this is exactly the query we've done a million times already. So now we are left with only the uh, entries for the people caught up in online or spam bot. Uh, and so now let us build a little piece, a, a little dictionary for our mail merge. So the two is going to be the account name at the domain. So the account name is sitting in dot key. So we're going to build a string which contains, so backslash open round bracket is how we pull something into a string. So we're saying, build me a string with the value of dot key followed by the symbol at followed by pbs.demo. That's our pretend email domain, right? There is no pbs.demo, but you know, that could be whatever, right? Then we're going to say the breach title. Okay, great. Where do we find the title for the breach? Well, the title for the breach is going to be in breach details zero dot online or spam bot, because it's a lookup table. So we just go straight to online or spam bot dot title. The date, breach detail zero dot online or spam bot dot breach date. The HTML description, you get the idea here, right? We mm -hmm. pull in breach zero dot online or spam bot dot description. And what was breached? Well, we shoved that through a join, and then that's our breach data field. So now we have little records that have been enriched. Let me ask a question here. So uh, you said um, you gave us the two, the breach title, breach date. You had a comma between each one of those, but then you say join it with commas. Uh, okay, so if you so we're building up a we're building up a dictionary here. We have an open curly bracket two colon. So the key two has the value that comma. The key breach title has the value that okay. comma. So that's just building our dictionary. But inside the string for breached data, like a CSV file needs a string. You can't give a CSV file an array. Okay, so the, so com the commas the array, are not the commas are not the CSV part. The commas between those uh, key value pairs. That's the that's the dictionary. Yes, exactly. So we're 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 still in plain old JQ land here. We're just, we're just building a dictionary with a two a breach title, a breach date, a breach description, and a breached data key. Okay. It, it still, it doesn't sit right in my brain that the join is inside of that dictionary, the creation of the, it, well, I guess, I would have thought it would be outside, be after. Okay, fact. but the, okay, but we are only doing that to make the value to go into the breached data key, right? The breach data key's value is a string that is joined together because... Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I thought this whole... Th I missed a, a parenthesis. I thought this entire... Everything you did, the two, the breach title, breach date, I thought that was all in the join. It's just the breach data piece. Uh, now, why did it have to have a join? Does it have... Because it has a bunch of information in it? Because it, it is an array. So if you look at the example, data classes is an array of strings. 
and we need to turn that into one string because the CSV file expects a single value. Okay, I'd forgotten what data classes was. It, that didn't have that memorized. Okay, because that's where it was. What did they lose? And so you want to precisely. Th- yeah, you want those with commas. I am now with you. I'm glad I asked the question because it Excellent. was a completely different so question I. than I thought. But okay, good. Perfect. So we have now put together our exploded pieces. So what exists at this point in our script is an array of dictionaries. And we now want to output those in CSV. So the first thing we'd like to output is the titles. So I just wrapped it in brackets to hold it all together. But basically, we make an array with the string to breach title, breach date. Basically, it's an array of strings that are our headers. And then we pipe that array of strings to at CSV. Because mm-hmm. at CSV insists on getting an array as input, and it will output one line of CSV. So that will give us our first line of our CSV, which is just the titles. Then we need to output the actual data. So this is a this is an example we haven't done in ages of the and also operator. Oh. We want to print the headers and also the data. So comma, and now again captured all together inside round brackets to keep it together. We explode our data so that we actually have lots of entries now. We pipe all of that to the JQ syntax to build a new array, and the array is going to have the values dot to, dot breach title. So in other words, the values from our lookup right. table are now being pulled into this array. Mm-hmm. And then that array is being piped to at CSV. So now we're going to get output a CSV, one line for everything in that array, for every dictionary we have. So it's going to give you the the title row first and then all of the other rows after that. Oh, that's cool. Exactly. That's really and slick. You, exactly. So if we do that on the terminal, we say jq minus or because we need raw output for the CSV. We do not want CSV in JSON. That would make <laughs> no sense. So every time you use CSV, it's always minus or for raw. So then we say minus f for pbs164-b.jq is the file that contains all that stuff we just talked about. Minus minus slurp file, breach details, then the have I been pwned details, and then our data file of, of breached people is the input, and then we redirect all of that to mailmerge.csv. And I didn't save mailmerge.csv because it's in CSV format, but if you run that yourself, you can open it in Excel, and it is a perfect CSV file ready to go into Outlook and be mail merged with your Word document with your fields in it. Okay, I'm going to do it. Good. I I I want to drink of coffee. I was rather hoping you'd... uh... All right. I'm opening it. It's opening in Excel, and I'm hoping that I didn't... My email address wasn't in this this breach. Why does Excel take so long to open in this... uh, In... uh, Because it's massive. Sonoma. No, but it's, it's, it's always been massive. Okay, no, good. Joe Sullivan and A. Hawkins, they got, they got stuck with email and passwords. Wasn't me. Yay. (laughs) So the only way to make this better. So we hard coded again, didn't we? We said dot online or spam bot dot title. Well, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that we do again what we did previously. We add an extra variable. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to call it breach name. And so everywhere in our code where we had the actual string, uh, what is it? Online one liner, not one liner. Yeah. Onliner spam bot, not one liner, onliner. <laughs> we replace that with dollar breach name. And the only very mild complication is that dollar breach detail zero dot. Well, you can't put the dollar sign there without wrapping it in square brackets because that is the syntax for looking up based on the value of a variable. So we just say, I need you to go into the key with the value of the variable breach type, breach name, which may be online or spam bot, it may be Dropbox, it may be LinkedIn or whatever. That's just saying the value of this variable is where you got to go and then pull me the title. So other than that, that's the only thing that's changed in this entire script. And so now we have a completely generic searcher that will build us a mail merge for any breach. Can't imagine why I would have developed such a thing. <laughs> So the only difference on the command line is that we now add a minus minus arg breach name Dropbox minus minus slurp file. All the rest is now the same as before. So we just have the minus minus arg so that we pass in what breaches are you looking for? In this case, we look for Dropbox. 
you know, I said it before, but I'm going to say it again. That's really slick. I like that. Isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah. Um, and especially once we have a CSV file, we really can't do anything with it, right? So we've now, we've taken some JSON data. We've enriched a whole other piece of JSON lookup data. And we've used it to build a CSV file that we could open in Excel and do a pivot table on or do a mail merge on or do whatever we want. This is data manipulation, right? This is bread and butter this is real data processing here. And yeah. this is why I adore JQ. This is this is his bread and butter. It is working with JSON as a data structure, as, as a source of data. So I have a challenge for you. Yay. I would like you to tweak my tweaked version here and make it just a little bit cleverer. So instead of finding the breaches that is exactly Dropbox with a capital D, I would like you to treat the, the variable as a search string. So any breach that contains the search string, and I would like you to be case insensitive. So if you ask it for a mail merge for everyone caught up in LinkedIn, you should end up finding the people caught up in three breaches because there were three breaches at LinkedIn, 20, 20, 2012, 2021, and 2023. And if you'd like some bonus credit, I would like you to filter down to only the breaches where passwords were exposed. Oh, if, if interesting. The breach didn't, if the breach didn't leak the password, it's not worth doing. Right, right. Do, let me ask you on the first part of it, are you making us do regular expressions? Uh, yes. This is a short answer, but remember, JQ has regular expression support. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And you don't have to do it with a regular expression. There is there, there is a JQ function called contains that may be useful. Yeah, uh, okay. That sounds fun. I, I, I don't want to disparage the Nobel Prizes, but we've done a lot with it. I like having a new data set to something else. I haven't quite decided what we're going to be me meeting next week. I think actually next week, I think we'll say with the have I been pwned data set next week because variables fit that data set nicely, actually. So probably. Anyway, I had thought a month ago <laughs> that lookup tables were a simple topic that we would do in a day. But actually, there was a lot of meat here. But yeah. I think it was really good. Like, this is really good stuff. So I learned a lot writing the notes, and I'm hoping people learned a lot uh, looking into it. And I had thought that the next thing we will be talking about would be altering arrays and dictionaries without exploding them. Because you can edit them in place, which is very useful, right? Because how many times today did I say explode and catch? Well, there's a better way than explode and catch. You can just edit them without exploding them. But that's going to be the installment after next, because I've been trying to find the right time to do variables. Because the JQ documentation is very clear that variables are not your variables should never be the first thing you reach for with JQ. They are needed for advanced usage. So until you're doing advanced things, if you're doing variables, you're making it more difficult than it needs to be. But we've really? now been at this a while. Yeah. But even in this example that you just gave, where it's like, well, I don't want to have to type it out every time. Yeah, I don't want okay, to hard that, code. Okay. So when I say sorry, when I say use variables, I mean declare a variable. We have we have not to this day declared a variable. We've well, sure used, you did. Dollar we, breach we, details. Right, but I did. I imported a variable from the command line. I didn't inside my JQ file uh -oh. make a variable come into being. Right, the variable was put, was brought in from outside inside the JQ ter command line. The variable came from the terminal. On the terminal, I went minus minus arg. No, no, no. Well, you wrote select any dot value equals equals dollar breach name. So you invented that. Right, that used... was where you declared it. No, it isn't. It was declared on the terminal when I said jq minus minus arg. If I had not done the minus minus arg, that would have been an error, right? I created the value on the terminal when I said minus minus arg or minus minus slurp file. That, they were created on the command line with those two flags. Right. Okay, I'm going to let you off on a technicality. <laughs> What's an important technicality because you yeah. do not know how to make, and you could not make a variable called dollar pancake anywhere but on the 
command line at the moment. You couldn't make one come into being inside the JQ file. Well, okay, hang on, hang on. I'm going to still see, it looks like there is one. On the command line, you created, or you used breach details was a, uh, to represent this JSON file. But in, mm-hmm. this, in the um, JQ, you said equals equals dollar breach name. Right, but look to the left of minus minus serp file is minus minus arg, where I made breach name. I said breach no. name becomes Dropbox, slurp file becomes breach details. It, no. Um, I'm looking, Definitely. We are looking at different lines because the line right above where you use dollar breach name does not have breach name in it. So I must be... Okay, but that's that JQ... Okay, so that JQ file doesn't run until the term, until the command line down at the bottom. Right, we don't actually run that file until down at the bottom. So that the variable is written in the file, but it doesn't have a value until okay, we there's, run the JQ. Now command. I see. There, there's another command line command after you describe the file. I was reading the one above it. Okay, okay. We will. I, I understand so, the technicality, and we will allow it. <laughs> yes, and it's that second kind the technicality kind is the kind of variable you only need for very advanced things like trying to reorder a lookup table where the value is an array of values it is impossible to re-index that without a variable as we will discover next time and as i discovered yesterday and spent two hours being quite cranky and then going oh i'm missing something what am i missing oh yeah variables and then I learned all about variables. And now, now I understand. And now I know why they, why they are what they are. Anyway, I'm starting to ramble, which means it's getting late and I should <laughs> wrap up. So next time we're doing variables and then we are finally going to stop exploding our tables. So no more explodey, t- no more explodey arrays in four weeks time. <laughs> Until then, <laughs> we keep exploding them and collecting the pieces. Okay, that sounds good. This was, this was really interesting, Bart. I liked it. Excellent. Well, until next time, happy computing. If you learn as much from BART each week as I do, I'd like you to go over to lets-talk.ie and press one of the buttons over there to help support him. He does 98% of the work here. I'm just the stooge that listens to him and asks the dumb questions. If you go over to lets-talk.ie, you can support him on Patreon, you can donate via PayPal, or you can use one of his referral links. I really hope you'll go over and help him out. In the meantime, you can contact me at Podfeet or check out all of the shows we do over there over at podfeet.com. Thanks for listening and stay subscribed.